Right, this is chapter 8, the Federalist Years, 1789 to 1801, uh, basically covering the first three elections, if you will. Let's look at the assignments that you'll have for the chapter. Section review pages the same, 143, 149, 154, same situation, CP numbered, and honors numbered and starred questions. Uh, notice that the student activity pages are also the same, 37, 39, and 40. Uh, all of this being due on Wednesday, October the 7th, assuming our dates are able to stay. And then we'll quiz on that date when they are due, and hopefully then on the Friday following, there will be a test on chapters 7 and 8. Now we're launching this new government. Remember President uh, George Washington now, first president and he is going to establish a cabinet who are going to be the first men that are going to be appointed by him that will help him and remember with the cabinet members uh, they are appointments by the president they do have to have senate approval um, that the president can fire one at any point but when he goes and gets a new one again senate approval will be involved so the first three here thomas jefferson being his first secretary of state Secretary of State having that responsibility then to represent us to other countries. Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury. Remember our government has had a problem of not having the financial funds it needs to operate, so we need to do something that will give us those funds and how to handle those funds. And then Henry Knox, the first head of the War Department. This will eventually become the Department of Defense. Um, since we have been out of school with the virus, we have seen a sixth branch added to that Department of Defense with the branch that deals with space. Henry Knox's significance and how he ended up in this place, remember that he led the men who went to Fort Ticonderoga and brought the guns back from Fort Ticonderoga to Boston and forced the British out of Boston. Now remember that there were several things that they wanted to see happen as soon as this Constitution was passed, whether it was by law or by amendment. The new government in 1789 immediately passes the Judiciary Act. We've, we've created this judicial branch, but we don't even know what it looks like. So they organized 13 district courts, one for each of the states at this point, and three circuit courts for appeals. And a circuit court of appeal is going to have several judges sitting on it, and they cover a region, obviously. And they set the number of Supreme Court justices at six. That number would later climb to nine. Uh, during the days of FDR in the 40s, he wanted that number to be able to fluctuate so that he could put some more justices on, but it did not work for him. Now remember, in order to be passed, there were states that said, hey, we want to see these Bill of Rights. So the first 10 amendments are such, and they were also added immediately. You know, when you think about the Constitution, the first ten amendments, this very first Congress accomplished a whole lot more than any Congress really since them. Uh, but there were then differences of opinion on how the Constitution itself should be uh, understood. Uh, one group would consider loose constructionists, advocating a more flexibility on a given issue. Basically, the idea of this given issue uh, would be if the Constitution doesn't say you can't, then you can't. And a strict constructionist held to a closer reading, which basically would say if it doesn't say you can, then you can't. And this is an issue that's going to come up right away uh, because of Alexander Hamilton, as Secretary of the Treasury, he wants there to be a national bank. And the Constitution said nothing about a national bank. So as a loose constructionist, Alexander Hamilton said, we can, and he spelled out reasons why this bank was important. And he was able to convince enough leadership that we will ultimately see that bank created, and it will stay in place until the mid-1830s or so, with a little gap in there of being closed down and started up again, but uh, basically that time period. The strict constructionists, meanwhile, said about the bank, the Constitution didn't say you can, therefore you can't but ultimately that national bank was going to pass. Um, one of the thing, other things that Hamilton wanted was for the government to assume all the debts that had been made by the states in order to fight the war. And again, states uh, 
didn't necessarily agree on that because ultimately the states are still going to pay because tax money is going to go to the government and you know some states didn't end up spending as much as other states or didn't have as great a debt and so that wasn't always looked upon as uh, something that looked fair but again the national bank was going to ultimately pass now the in the ideal world there was going to be one political party one type of leadership that was always simply about the best for the government. That really was not going to uh, end up being realistic as these loose constructionists, strict constructionists already show us there's differences of opinion. Um, and political parties are going to start to emerge based on where we think we should be. Okay, uh, 1789, the French Revolution breaks out. And you know, the French are looking at it saying, hey, we're doing the same thing that the Americans did. And yet the Americans looked at this and said, well, no, that's not exactly right. I mean, after all, you're executing uh, leadership and all that. And in fact, you know, it was England that cut us off first. So it wasn't the same. Um, within just a few short years, notice that England and France are at it again. They're fighting, and you know we're trying to conduct business with both sides. We just we're a new country. We just want to trade, and we're getting pulled into this uh, over time, and we don't want to be. And but we're being looked at, especially France, looking at us. All right, we were on your side against England. You should be on our side against England. And ultimately, in 1793, Washington issues the proclamation of neutrality. We're going to stay out of England and France's war. Well, that doesn't just sort of end things and you know say, okay, they're done. They're they're not going to try to get our help. No, in fact, uh, Citizen Genet was a French ambassador. He's going to come our way, but instead of presenting himself to George Washington like should have been appropriate, he started off in Charleston, South Carolina, and he makes his way up through the country, trying to drum up financial support and moral support and all of that for the for the French. Uh, eventually uh, giving you know introducing himself to George Washington like he should have to begin with. In the midst of all this, the French government is going to fall and Citizen Genet is no longer French ambassador. And in fact he doesn't want to go back to France because because he's under that former government. If he goes back, he could be put to death. And so he asks for asylum and receives asylum, you know, basically getting to stay in the United States uh, for the rest of his life. Just a side note here that we look at um, that from your book came up earlier, but it's just a side note from 148. It's about Daniel Boone. Again, Americans are moving out to the West. America's best known frontiersman, Daniel Boone, it was, some people would say of Daniel Boone, he kept moving out west because he was moving away from debts. Uh, he would have said he's moving away from people. He liked his independence and being away from everybody. But the question is whether or not our government is going to be able to uh, make it. Uh, one thing we're not including in the notes from 146 is that about Jay's treaty. Jay, John Jay. Uh, is going to, even though he is Supreme Court Chief Justice, he's going to go and meet with the English, and he's going to work out uh, a treaty, if you will. Our problem with the British is that they have been stopping American ships and practicing impressment. It's going to be a problem that continues to the War of 1812, um, where they're taking men off saying, you're a British citizen, not an American, and therefore you've got to, to fight for the British Navy. Uh, and he'll work out a treaty, sort of, but it basically doesn't really get us anything. Uh, but it's because we really don't have that uh, ability to back up anything we might would threaten to do. Uh, so our government is doing better, but it is still struggling with some weakness in, for in foreign affairs. An example of the strength of the government comes out in the Whiskey Rebellion there on page 147. Um, in this, we have, again, an internal tax taking place on those, on farmers who are producing whiskey, and that was a lot of farmers. 
um, because they're growing grain and they don't want to pay the tax and so ultimately they're going to lead a rebellion against it, grumbling. And this was taking place in western Pennsylvania. So George Washington calls out the troops and he goes down, goes and puts down the uh, rebellion pretty quickly. Um, basically, it shows that the national government now possesses the strength and will to enforce the law. Now, this is bringing us to the end, actually, of Washington's second term. You know, the first term, George Washington, John Adams, second term, same thing. And, again, and they didn't want Washington to leave early after that first term was done because they didn't think they were strong enough, would you serve another term? So he does. But at the end of two, he basically gives us that precedent of two terms. It wasn't law. It wasn't in the Constitution at this point. It will after FDR. But um, in, his, in his farewell address after that second term, he basically outlines our foreign basic, our basic foreign policy until World War II, which was a policy of isolationist. We're going to stay out. Now, Washington also, by serving that second term, could begin to see that there were sides and divisions in politics. And he was really concerned about what would happen to the country if we split up. But after that second term and he's done, this is exactly what we're going to see as an issue. Because remember, at this point, we are Federalists. And then the other side, the Anti-Federalists, have now taken on the name of Republicans. Uh, the Republicans of this day would be what we would consider now our Democrats. Okay? So the Federalists nominate John Adams. You know, Alexander Hamilton was the top name, but he was considered to be too controversial, too antagonistic, and so he's likely to lose. The Republicans, meanwhile, have nominated Thomas Jefferson. Now keep in mind, we're under the Constitution at this point that said the one that gets the most votes uh, wins the presidency. The one with the second most votes gets to be the vice president. With the goal being, they both had somebody in mind of being the vice president from their own party, but that's not how the vote ends up working. Uh, it ends up going with John Adams wins the presidency as a Federalist, but his vice president is Thomas Jefferson. So that's going to create a problem in the leadership. And, you know, Congress will ultimately address this with an amendment coming up very soon that will basically say, President and Vice President, you're, you're sort of going as a team to guarantee they're from the same party. Now, we don't necessarily do that in every state, or I don't know how many states North Carolina doesn't do it. We have a Democratic governor, a Republican lieutenant governor. Okay. Now, on page 150, you'll see this idea of the quasi-war. Notice it's a definition here, a conflict resembling a war in nearly every particular except a formal declaration. We're, uh, the, we're having problems still with the French and the British and uh, what's going on here and who we're uh, supporting or not supporting, trying to conduct business with both, and yet we're still finding ourselves being attacked. So meanwhile, we send um, representatives in 1797. We're going to send some representatives to speak with the French. And the French foreign minister, Charles Talleyrand, Hence, through three of his agents, that he would negotiate with the Americans for a price. You know, the price was going to be uh, money for each of the directors, and then a big sum of money as a loan to the French government itself. Uh, you know, in other words, you pay our bribe, and we will cooperate with you. Okay? The Americans came back and told the president, and Congress wanted to know what this was all about. And so Adams is going to tell Congress what it's all about, but he's going to take out the French names of these three and instead replace it with X, Y, and Z, hence the three letters. And Congress is told uh, what has taken place, and we're pretty upset as a nation with 
the French at this point. What it's going to basically encourage us to do uh, in Congress is to start spending some money to consider building our own Navy. Now, in doing so, though, uh, we again see that there's a division. Your, uh, your Republicans under Jefferson have favored the French because Jefferson at one time had been the ambassador to France. Um, and then your Federalists favored the, the British. So you get this problem going on, and what we ultimately find out is that the Federalists who are controlling Congress at this point uh, passes the Alien Acts. Okay, the President greatly expanded powers to expel or imprison undesirables. Basically, this is anybody that's going to speak out or do something towards the government or appear to. Uh, it's a lot of control. Add in the Sedition Act, and we've got penalties for anti-government activities. It's illegal for you to speak or write anything against the government or the president. Imagine how many people would be in prison today if that were the law today. Most any news reporter, most any protester, most and a lot of government officials who have spoken out negatively against other government officials. Uh, so it'd be a tremendous number of people that would not be out on the streets. But ultimately, uh, in time, Supreme Court will rule that these are unconstitutional laws. Uh, what's going to push for this are Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Both of these resolutions said that these were violation of the First Amendment and that states had the right to judge the constitutionality of a law. So now the states are trying to put their authority over the federal government and the federal government saying, no, our authority is over you. And that's going to be that states' rights issue that's going to be part of the Civil War. Who, who is the ultimate authority? Do the states really have that right? So, under these resolutions, the states could nullify government acts that the states considered unconstitutional. Again, think about the, uh, the challenges that we would have, the, the difficulties that we would have if you know, we could constantly do that. And especially uh, even given this time period that we've been under the, the virus. And, um, and what if we, and then we see he, even on the local level, how this has happened. The, the governor says, I'm going to mandate this, and there have been county sheriffs who said, I'm not going to enforce that. Even Cooper himself, when he was attorney general, there were things that were passed as law that he said, I won't enforce. You know, that's the same thing as nullifying, saying, I don't think it's constitutional, and he made himself judge and jury. Uh, so interesting things. So this struggle with authority, the struggle with cooperation, the struggle with uh, individual rights is nothing new. Um, these resolutions suggested that states had a right to secede when the federal government acted unconstitutionally. 1796, go to 1861 and watch what happens. So you reach the election of 1800 and Jefferson chooses, the Republicans choose Thomas Jefferson and his running mate is going to be Aaron Burr. The Federalists will choose John Adams and Charles Pinckney. Okay, uh, Down the road in the next election, it'll be Jefferson again, but he won't be choosing Aaron Burr, and we'll see why as we get to Chapter 9. And the Federalists will again try John Adams, uh, but they'll try a, another Pinckney relative. Now, what the parties then do was they start to work together within their party about trying to figure out how to resolve things, especially after this election, because watch what happens. Jefferson and Burr tie, because enough votes went for both of them, thinking we're going to get one first, one second. All right, they are Republicans. When there was a tie, the tie goes to the House, the House decides. The House was still Federalist. It took them 35 votes 
to decide that Jefferson was a better choice as president than Aaron Burr. Ultimately, probably a good thing. Because by 1804, Aaron Burr is going to shoot and kill Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Now, on his way out the door, John Adams, again with this uniqueness of only serving one term, John Adams on his way out the door in 1801 is going to increase the number of federal judges um, that the point being they are federal judges appointed by federalists therefore they will favor federalist laws uh, and that will keep the federalists in essence in power in that way so those will all be issues about these appointments and in fact one of these appointments is going to uh, come up and the Supreme Court is going to have to jump in and deal with the issue. So by this we should be finishing with first quarter and chapters and uh, looking forward to a test that covers chapter 7 and 8. Don't forget look at the beginning for any assignments but especially classroom uh, to determine if the dates are still the same for due dates and any assignment changes that may have taken place.